Good morning and welcome to another Q News video interview. My name is Michael James and today I have another very exciting guest for you. We're not at home today. We are across the world and we are in New York City and we are with one of my favourite drag contestants, performers, hosts, extraordinaires, um, who I'm very excited to be chatting with today. Um, joining us from across the world is the gorgeous Miss Peppermint. Hello, Peppermint. Hello. Hi, Michael. <laughs> <sighs> oh, it's such a pleasure. How are you today? I am pretty, I'm actually pretty good. It's the, the obviously we're in different, different time zones. And the, the day, the night is still young, as they say, but things are going pretty well at this point. <laughs> very, very nice. <laughs> well, there's been a lot going on for you from the time that we first saw you when you walked into the door uh, as the first queen to enter the war workroom on season nine of RuPaul's Drag Race. Things have been going off for you. So I wanted to start back there. <laughs> um, I want to start back on Drag Race. Um, that's a big milestone for any queen these days to get in and appear on that show what was that like for you being selected back on season nine which seems like so long ago now seems like ages ago it was a several years ago now and you know it was it was uh it was a uh, well, it was wonderful i mean there's no other way to put it i i knew that it was going to be uh life-changing for myself for my career uh and and that's exactly what it was and you know I, I auditioned a few times to try to get on and third time's a charm made it on uh and you, funny you mentioned me walking into the into the workroom first because i didn't even know that i was you know you know they have you sequestered everybody understands that by now and so w we don't get to meet each other until that moment and i you know they were telling me okay you're going to go in and meet all the other queens and I, I i was preparing to go in and meet a bunch of other queens in the room and I walked in and it was empty and I was like what this is a come on like I I thought that I was gonna get like a woo, you know something and it was just like literally me by myself and so um and so that was really interesting and I was waiting backstage for hours so surely I thought I was last turns out I was first uh but the the experience was a great experience it's sort of two two experiences there's the experience of like making the show and filming a tv show <laughs> filming a reality tv show where you get to know everyone around you, not only the other uh, drag talent on the show, but then of course also the people behind the scenes, the camera people, the producers, the directors, and things like that. And then there's the experience of like having the show play out on TV later for people to see. And this is a lot of, in many cases, nearly a year after you have been on, after you did it. And so it's it's uh, it's really interesting to to watch that sort of thing back. But I I feel like I had a good idea of what to expect. And I, you know, like, I didn't think that I was going to tune in and see me like, you know, um, punching anyone in the face because I didn't do that. So <laughs> if, if, if they figured out a way to make me do that, then I would be like, whoa, this is crazy. Uh, but yeah, I had, I had a great time. And um, um, I got more than I ever thought that I would get out of it. Well, it, it gives and it takes that show and it's a, it's a very interesting phenomenon. It was an interesting thing I actually just read that um, you mentioned when you talk about finding out what happened. I didn't realise they filmed an alternate ending to you not getting into the finale. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it's true. Uh, they, uh, I think Drag Race around season three or four uh, started filming alternate endings uh, which is not entirely unheard of in the world of reality TV. I remember I did an episode, a couple of episodes of uh, America's Next Top Model with Tyra Banks, and uh, they didn't film, and I wasn't there for the finale, so they didn't, weren't doing an alternate ending that I saw, but they actually had eliminated, ca they had the, the, the cast members that were there that were still competing, and then we went in and did what we needed to do. And then they also still had the eliminated cast members nearby, and they brought them in to film, I guess, like B roll footage or like something else to like throw the scent off so that they weren't actually there and involved in the, in the competition anymore. Um, and so I kind of had, I kind of got the hint that that's those are the kind of tricks that the <laughs> reality show people pull. Um, and so when we were uh, filming, it was nearly the finale and they, um, you know, we did, it was the 
category is, which is episode 12 or something. And uh, we were going from four to three. And so we had our, uh, we had to do a song and we did recorded the song and we did the song. And up until that point, I, of the top four, I had had the worst record. I had the least amount of wins. That's, I had the least amount of wins. And so I expected that they would send me home. And that, honestly, it's, it's odd. That seems to have been the vibe is that like, you're going to go home. Um, and so I, not that I was hoping to go home, but I was like, you know, I'm not, I won't be surprised. And so the, uh, certainly other things on that show have surprised me way more than, than me having <laughs> to go home. And so I, uh, but I, luckily for me, it was a challenge that I felt really connected to. And I feel like I excelled and did a good job at, um, and I, it was probably one of the challenges that I, I, for, performed the best at for my own sort of performance um, compared to other things that I had done earlier in the season. And so I don't know if it's just because it was less competition around or if it's because I did a great job or both or whatever, but you know, they, the plan was they're like, okay, you're going to do this. And like all the other things, we're going to eliminate somebody and then that person's going to go home and then that's it. And so that's what, what we were planning on doing. And so we filmed it, we, we, we did the challenge, we had the runway, and they said, you know, peppermint, sachet away. And, you know, I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then they, a long story short, they ended up calling us all back in and filming each and every one of us going home. And then they filmed an episode where, or not an episode, they filmed a take where we no one went home. So when we left there, we didn't know who who was going to go home. I was the first one to get eliminated that they filmed. So I, I was like, they're just doing that to be nice. And they're, they're you know, in the rule of film, you get the most important thing that you want to get first. And so I knew that that was what was going to go. Um, but to my surprise, uh, what they aired, because we didn't find out really basically, it's pretty much until it aired, what they aired was all four of us going. And so that was um, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet. <laughs> and of course, because the um, the finale was still live, like they were just going to call any of you up and be, by the way, you're coming to the finale next week. Yeah. And they, they called us. Uh, we had a, like a little more than a week's notice. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, I obviously I knew when the episode aired that I was going to be going to the finale and they gave us a, not very much notice, but we had a little more than a week's notice to get everything together and they sent us the, some music. And the funny thing is we were on tour, uh, like while the oh. season was airing and then we were supposed to come back to do the finale. Um, and so we were on tour. We didn't know like what to expect or who was going to go. What. So it was, it was, it was really, um, you know, it was quite unnerving. <laughs> 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 I bet. I mean, the whole process would have to be unnerving. Um, but you delivered so powerfully and so poignantly um, in your time on the show. And I think one of the, the greatest things that you um, did on that show and we've seen afterwards is your ability to be a storyteller um, and your ability to tell powerful stories, uh, both with your words and also through your representation and your presence. Um, and, you know, it was back in one of those first early episodes when you told that awful story um, that also ended up being uplifting about what happened to you in high school. Um, but also your, your storytelling from there as a, as a, a trans woman of color um, and that journey through the show and afterwards, what has that been like for you in terms of the people that you've affected and the story that you've been able to take forward from there? My journey as a trans woman, uh, it's been, you know, I've been extremely um, blessed and, and I feel very fortunate to be able to uh, not only hold space as a queer person of color on a main, mainstream TV show, but then also, you know, have the opportunity to tell some of my own personal story. And, and I, you know, don't, I don't, um, it, that doesn't fall very lightly on me because I know that, you know, these days, especially in the world of Hollywood pre pandemic, we were really ha stuck on in the conversation about how, if and or how, transgender stories, queer stories should be told in the media, and 
And so being able to obviously pre pandemic season nine, being able to do that for myself. And, and I really did feel, I was worried about, I wasn't worried about what, how, how I was going to come off or, you know, I, I felt very connected to who I am and what I was doing and how that would play on TV. But I, I, I certainly didn't know how people would receive it. And, uh, and I'm, watching having watched RuPaul's Drag Race back I was very pleased like I was like okay this is how who who I was representing this is me this is you know because I know I we hear all the time that there's folks that are like that's not how I wanted to come off and so I wasn't putting anything on I was just you know being myself and so I I, I feel very grateful for that and I'm glad that my story did resonate with some people and they were they were able to connect with uh some of the things that i said and did on the show uh and and i feel so good about that and and i'm hopeful that that will remain there uh that my sort of existence as a trans woman on this show will remain that idea will remain uh because you know there i didn't really have those types of examples when I was growing up. And I'm so grateful now that even in this season, even though people are talking about um, uh, Matty Morphosis, who is <laughs> a cisgender heterosexual man, uh, we have two other, fa two fabulous, we have a whole season of new queens and, and new entertainers that we're gonna meet who are talented, but two of them are out trans women. And uh, that's fantastic, you know, and, and I'm, I'm just, it's something to celebrate, you know. Um, but my contribution as a trans woman on Drag Race, I, I, I'm i very proud of it. As you should be. It was, um, a, it was, you know, paving the way. And I think because of your appearance back in season nine, we have seen that show evolve um, as it needs to. And, you know, you started it all <laughs> just by being there. Um, well, there were there certainly were other trans women who were are associated with the show and were on the show. I remember historically, uh, Sonique came out. Kylie Sonique Love came out in in season two. Of course, there was in the reunion, and then uh, just quite dramatically, uh, Kenya came out in. Um, I'm sorry, Monique. Sorry, not Kenya. Monique uh, came out. Uh, Monica, not Monique. Monica Beverly Hills came out uh, in on her season, but we weren't able to enjoy her on the show much longer after that. And so I wanted to make sure that I had the ability to just be out from the get go on the show. Uh, and I came out to the Queens in the room, you know, a few episodes in, cause I was getting to know them, but. Oh. And it really did um, call sort of, was my internet connection okay? It went a little glitchy, but it got you again, I think. Okay. Um, it really did. There there was a question that there was a little bit of a conversation that I remember hearing back when I was on season nine about, well, if you don't have, you know, surgeries or this or that, are you really a woman? And I think uh, that that's a conversation about that's worth having. I obviously don't appreciate it about my body, but it is something that is a, an interesting conversation that I think that we st we all just collectively still have to sort of sort out how we judge bodies of people, but women in particular, <laughs> um, you know, that and so and so that's a little bit of a different topic. But, uh, you know, I, I was grateful to be able to to be, you know, an out trans woman and I believe the first out trans woman to enter the workroom already out as trans. And that was uh, not that easy to do. <laughs> I can imagine. Big steps, mama, big steps. <laughs> um, now, one last question on, on Drag Race before we move away from that, because you've got so many other things I can talk to you about. Um, but we do want to know, now you, uh, your season of Drag Race is arguably one of actually the most successful. It's produced three winners um, and nearly half of the cast have returned uh, to do the show at least once or twice after. And your name, you and Shake Alay were two of the, the names I've seen thrown around as people wanting to return to the show again by the fan base uh, more than anybody else. And we haven't seen you come back. Is there a reason? Have you been asked and you've said no or is your time for Drag Race just passed now? I have been harassing Shay. Why haven't you gone back? And I'm, I wanna know why Shay hasn't gone back either. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but no, I, I was asked to do All Stars and it was a couple of years ago and I was uh, unable to do it because of scheduling. And I, uh, I'm so sorry about that. I know that there are fans who mentioned that they would like to see me back on the show. And, you know, maybe it'll happen again. Maybe they'll ask me again. I don't know. You know, I, it's, it's uh, the process of going back to returning to RuPaul's Drag Race is obviously different than the process of like auditioning for the first time. But it's not like I could just be like, Ru, I'm coming, you know, oh, oh, <laughs> give me the keys for house. You know, it's, it's not, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, so they'd have to invite me back again. And I would have to be making sure that my calendar was completely clear, which means in New York, not paying my rent while I'm waiting. And that is a very difficult decision to make. It was tough to do the first time uh, and it was worth it. But luckily I had something called Broadway to fall back on. While I wasn't able to do RuPaul's Drag Race, again, I was able to do Broadway. And that was a really big moment. That was actually what my dream when I moved to New York City. I wanted, I dreamt of being on Broadway. That was before RuPaul's Drag Race was even a show. And so that dream for me was a much longer awaited dream. And I'm glad I was able to fulfill, fulfill it, even though at the time I wasn't able to do RuPaul's Drag Race. I had to choose between the two. And I obviously chose my dream. Stop. That's amazing. Being on Broadway, that's something <laughs> every little boy dreams of. <laughs> hello, hello. Um, so you moved on from, from Drag Race and uh, flash forward to this year in the middle of two awful pandemic years, um, we get this brilliant news that there's this gorgeous new show popping up and it's a drag show um, and it's not Drag Race. It's got nothing to do with Drag Race and it's called Call Me Mother uh, and it features yourself from Drag Race, Crystal from the UK and Barbada um, from Canada. Um, and it was such a breath of fresh air. Um, I loved that the three of you came in and minty it was- Minty fresh air. Minty fresh, I see what you did there. <laughs> um, but I love that in no way, shape or form did this show try to be Drag Race um, and that it came in with this completely different approach that had this tiny little show, because it is only little. Your stage is only little and everything is about it is so little, but the heart in the show is so big. Um, what, um, I suppose, influence did you have in the creation and the execution of how that show played out and the casting and all of those things? I uh, had, uh, the, the, the influence that I had in the production of the show, the creation of the show, uh, full disclosure, I am an executive producer on the show, um, but I was really more involved in the theatrical aspect of it. And so, you know, there were some some of some of the larger things that my, my biggest role in the show was as a mother and a judge. And then, of course, in that way, I was involved in the casting. Uh, I was you know, we would decided who what we some of the way some of the folks that we wanted in our picture auditions, we got to look at their pictures and their videos and things like that. And then uh, but that's as far as it goes with that in terms of who was going to be on the show uh, and then other little things, you know, like I would make some suggestions here and there and some um, little things with the, how, the logistics of the show was the first season. And so we wanted to make sure that it ran as smoothly as we could. And, and honestly, what a gift it is that they had two people from RuPaul's Drag Race. And then, of course, all three of us as the mothers have had so much experience or a certain amount of experience as drag entertainers professionally, both doing film and television projects and things like that. And so we wanted to use that experience. And, and the producers, the other producers were uh, very um, happy to to welcome us into that situation and so it was it felt very collaborative at at times sometimes it didn't um and but it shouldn't because you know we we are judges uh, on the show uh and but it, it was a wonderful experience and uh i that was part what you mentioned about sort of some of the differences um that we've seen and 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 this sort of newer take on drag reality tv is why i wanted to do it i mean when they first said do you want to do a drag reality tv show i said hell no i don't want to do that <laughs> you know what <laughs> i have to do something else um but when they explained to me that they were that they wanted to be more inclusive with their casting and, and their representation and all of these things and and that it was really more about the sort of the family connection and aspect, the houses, the the connection between the mothers and the and the drag uh, children or our artists. 
then it was obviously much clearer to me that this is something that this is the kind of show that if I were if I were going to create a drag reality TV show, this is the kind of thing that I would want to make. Um, and so that's what we did. Well, speaking of casting, that was one of the things that I just loved about this show is because it was a, a, a casting of anyone and it didn't matter. You had non-binary folk, you had drag kings, you had um, just everyone. <laughs> um, and I loved mm -hmm. that connection with, with drag and that sense of self and identity uh, and how that enabled all of the mothers to really connect with each of the children in their houses. And you talked about before your time on Drag Race and how that led to, you know, how you were representing people and how people saw you. The relationship that you had with Felicia on the show, I think was a really beautiful indication of exactly what you created by being on TV to be somebody there for somebody to look up to and they could walk in and be mentored by you. That must have been a, a lot of feeling or something else there for you. It was. And I, you know, I, I look, I, I obviously if we're doing a drag competition show, they know what drag race is. And I'm, I'm, I'm I would be surprised if any of the contestants on there hadn't heard of RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> And so I, you know, considered that there's going to be someone there who has seen, watched my season and might have seen me. Uh, I expected that there would be somebody who's, who knows who I am as a drag entertainer and sort of respected that or connected to that. But to know that we had a Black trans woman on the show who does drag, who says that she was inspired by, by me, um, was you know, it was just so touching. And to be honest with you, no one really, this is the thing that's interesting. The, the producers did not give us the resumes or bios of the, of the drag entertainers before we watch, before we saw them. We only heard what they wanted to tell us in their tapes. And most of them did not tell us how they personally identified in their tapes. We obviously their drag would speak for itself. Um, and so I didn't even know that Felicia was trans when I saw her in drag, because that was the first time I saw I just saw her in drag. And so I didn't know how she identified. And it wasn't until after I chose her that I found out <laughs> that she, that she wow. was trans. So it, it feels, it felt very sort of like fate in that moment and, and sort of meant to be. And obviously there was something that drew, drew us towards each other. And that I saw, as I said on the show, I saw my I saw some of myself in her and so I you know maybe that obviously that's probably what it was but um it was a, it was a special connection and a special moment and you know having all of these different having different identi differently identified drag entertainers as my drag in, in my house uh felt wonderful I had someone of trans experience someone who's non-binary uh in my house that was able to give us and 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 not only did did someone ident does 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 someone identify as non-binary <laughs> in the house but they're also their drag i'm speaking of toddy is also very fluid they can do femme drag they do mask like king they do sometimes just non-binary presentations and it's all drag and so that's just what's so great you know, is being able to see all of these folks. And there's really no reason for like us to like segregate in on the show. We're able to, everyone's able to do the, the challenges. Everyone's able to do the show. And we don't have to like be like, oh, you have to sit this one out or that's not for you. Like everyone just does it. And there's no distinction. Whoever wins, wins and everybody plays the game. Uh, and so I, I certainly don't mean to minimize or I can't even editorialize anyone's experience of the show. I don't know what it was like to experience it. But from our perspective, there was no need to to wholly set apart. It was it was more beneficial to have everyone together, you know? That's exactly how it read. I mean, and it was, it was very clear. And that was what was said every episode, drag artists. And it was a drag competition. And it wasn't, you're right, about putting drag kings over here and mask and femme. And it was this blend of the binary and the non-binary and trans and femme and mask. And you would just had these 10 contestants there who were just the most beautiful blend of different walks of life and drag styles. Um, and you had them there 
not just competing, but also learning and interacting. And that was another key difference as well. You literally, you were looking at episodes in the workroom where you've got the mothers are sitting there and you know, saw Crystal sitting at the sewing machine. Like it was, <laughs> it was really about a mentoring and bettering um, and really working with these people rather than pitting them against each other um, to make bitchy TV. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's, that is entertaining, but only to an extent you know mm. and uh in, in my opinion and what is certainly the, the 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 essence that fuels the art of drag uh fuels the performances and the the the, the gusto between make behind making the costumes and the ideas and conceiving different uh performances just in, gen in general whether on tv or in a drag bar the the thing that really pushes drag from one i hate to sound like i'm not trying to give platitudes here but like from one generation to the next and i think the thing that makes drag so relatable is the fact that it is for everyone and that everyone can enjoy it regardless of whether being a gay straight queer whatever you know like anyone can enjoy it and anyone can participate in it despite what some people how some people feel or what their opinions are uh, and that's the that's the appeal of it. That's it's, it's since it's for everyone, then everyone's attracted to it. Everyone instantly knows what drag is. I don't care where you go in the world. If you're in the of the modern era, you know what drag is. You might not have seen Drag Race, but you know what drag is, and you know how you feel about it. And if you haven't ever seen it before, the minute you see it, you know exactly what it is, and you know how you feel about it, and it makes you feel something. And it's all different. And so that is what. I think the real essence is it's not about having two bitchy queens throwing drinks on each other and car and you know being shady. That happens naturally. But what really f I what I find and what I found going from local bar to local bar traveling even before doing Drag Race is drag queens backstage helping each other, trans and cis back there. Be one's the mother, one is the daughter. Like that is what it really the essence of drag is. Couldn't have said it better that uh, and you really encapsulated that on the show and it's it's been a wild ride to watch um i literally just made my husband go back and binge watch the entire because he hasn't seen any of it so we did it all on sunday and he was just like <laughs> hooked He's like i want to know who wins now um so we're down to the final three here in australia we haven't seen beyond the final three we don't i, I think we've got one episode left to come i'm not sure before mm -hmm. we get to see who takes out the crown but i'm very excited and your house had a bit of a stellar run on the show just quietly i would say so thank you very much and you know one of the things that i was not to sp be a spoiler but uh the one of the things that i was really proud of in a recent episode was our house won a an advantage a time advantage where we would get more time than the other houses and our my house that on their own they just decided that they wanted to use that time advantage for the entire group they just gave it to the everyone and you know like that wasn't a shady like you know calculated thing it was literally to help the group out because they it was they knew that working it was a group um challenge uh that everyone working and having that time it would just be a better product and that's what drag entertainers want they want to be able to work together to make the show better there uh, there are exceptions to every rule but the people that i've seen are more likely to sacrifice to make it better rather than saying i'm gonna like you know put holes in everyone's dresses so that everyone's dresses fall off and i'll be the winner like you know it's it's not it's not like you've seen on tv <laughs> absolutely i mean that that episode and that moment really Still encapsulated now. that <laughs> Uh, really encapsulated that sense of family that there really is on the show so thank you very much for bringing that to us now i want to know give us give us the hot goss tell us have we got a season two of call me mother coming or is we still T tbc who knows it is <sighs> it's to be seen i hope so i hope that people uh who enjoyed season one because we're still in season one it, if uh i hope that people who see Season one uh, will share it as much as they can with everyone and everyone listening here. Uh, I have my fingers crossed. I'll tell you this, when we were filming the show, uh, when we wrapped, we we said on set, there's all, it feels like there should be a season two. Like there's, this feels like it's ready for a season two. So that's still my opinion. 
<laughs> well, I agree with you as well. So uh, everybody else in Australia, if you haven't seen Call Me Mother yet, now is the time. You simply need to go to primevideo.com.au slash out TV um, and that will allow you to add in the out TV subscription to your Prime Video account and then you'll have access to Call Me Mother and a range of other great queer programs. Actually a whole heap of queer stuff on there that's really good just quietly. Isn't a brave yeah, promotion I, I, whatsoever. <laughs> Hello. Well, I will say and after you watch or while you're watching or if you need to take a quick break from watching Call Me Mother, please watch my short film that I produce, wrote and produced. It's called A Girl Like Me. Uh, it's basically the story of an out proud black trans woman and her journey through love. And where can we see that? It's on Out TV. Oh, I looked everywhere for it recently. I didn't look on it our is. TV, it's did I? It's on there, baby. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's oh my God, it TV. is. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I swear it wasn't there when I looked last time. <laughs> uh, I believe you. Uh, and so I hope people are able to enjoy that. It's basically, the, the, it's, it's a short film, it's a narrative, and it is scored by the music on my latest album, A Girl Like Me, Letters to My Lovers. Beautiful. Do go and get the two reasons now to go and get your own TV subscription if you don't already. <laughs> Love that. Um, now, Pep, we just can't seem to get enough of you. On top of all of this, oh, you decided you'd be a movie star this week um, and she's going to be in a movie. Um, sharing, sharing, the screen, the sh sharing the screen with just a few queens we might have seen before. Um, you are 20. in. I know, only 20 of you? Um, <laughs> the Bitch Who Stole Christmas. Yes. What? What is that all about? Because we've seen RuPaul do a Christmas special before. So I was a little scared because I know how some of us felt about the first Christmas special. So what's different I mean, about this one? I don't, know. I don't know how you felt. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I, this, it, this was something very different for, uh, for World of Wonder, who are the producers of Drag Race to do. Uh, this is uh, quite a, 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 an undertaking for them to to try to do. We shot this film in a remarkably short amount of time, um, but I really did enjoy filming it. Now, the story for people who don't know, it's basically, I mean, it's, they, they just like RuPaul's Drag Race, they take the best of some of the most classic uh, Christmas movies, uh, the storylines, and put it all into one. But essentially it really does feel a lot like uh, the Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> uh, okay. And, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in that's the tone of the beginning of it, or at least some of it. Uh, but it's about a, a journalist, a fashion journalist who goes to a small town to sort of infiltrate and, and learn all about their, um, their Christmas pageant uh, lifestyle. And uh, there's a Christmas, a bit of a Christmas caper, um, and the ladies in the town uh, are have to win the pageant in order to save the inn, uh, the hotel. And I'm one of the, the the four best friends who live in the town. I play a cab driver, a very bad cab driver, named <laughs> Beep. I don't know why I have that name. Her name's Beep. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Go on. Tell me more. And so well, that's that's the storyline, and and people have to tune in to find out the rest. Right now, it's playing on VH1, and I think the VH1 app and and dot com and everything. Um, and it's uh, it was it's great. It's it's obviously stars RuPaul, Krista Rodriguez, Andy Ridings, uh, Anna Marie Horsford, who is in the states of of has such a legacy of uh brilliant black television she's been a part of so many uh his, his tv shows going back to the 80s and then we have uh all your favorites from rupaul's drag race and the four ladies in the town are myself brooklyn heights ginger minge and jan sport and it's there they are an absolute hoot working with them and getting close with them being ridiculous with them we would we worked all we filmed for so long every day and we would film we filmed a lot of times overnight which means that we would finish at like six or seven in the morning after filming all night. and we would we would be like stupefied and delirious and catatonic <laughs> and go over <laughs> to the um 
we would get breakfast as our dinner. We would go and have dinner breakfast at this wonderful restaurant that had the best breakfast. I don't know if we were just delirious or if there was really good breakfast. It tasted delicious. And we would wait, we would wait for the restaurant to open. And then we would go and we eat our breakfast dinner and we would laugh and take pictures of each other and post them with no filters and then uh, go to sleep and do it all over again the next day. And these girls I became really close with. Oh, beautiful. Well, I mean, no wonder it took so long. You had 20 drag queens to deal with there. <laughs> that, that is obviously going to make things go a little bit longer. Because no, y'all aren't always the best for being on time, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't but the you, queens, trust me. <laughs> uh, well, some of the 19 other people you had on here. So I'm just looking at the list. Brooklyn Heights, Chad Michaels, Ginger Minge, Got Mick, Heidi and Closet, James Mansfield, Jan, Kelly Mantle, Kamora Black, Kylie Sonique Love, Laganja Estranja, Latrice Royale, Manila Luzon, Mayhem Miller, Morgan McMichaels, Pandora Box, Pork Shop, Raven, and Rockham Sakura. That represents every season of Dragon Race except for, I think it's season eight and five, if my math is correct. Oh, but That's Manila was in, the, in it. Yeah, I'm I said Manila. Sure list, but... Yeah, yeah oh, I said Manila. Like, Manila was not in eight. I don't know what I'm thinking. Um, the, are there anybody from eight was in that? No, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, maybe it was five know, and eight. We didn't have anyone from most of the eight girls. Well, some of the eight girls were obviously on. We're here. <laughs> Everyone being on everything these days. <laughs> yeah, there's um, most most seasons. It's they did a great job of getting. I guess it's they're it's right the most historic, you know, grouping of drag entertainers in one movie from RuPaul's Rag Race, yeah. Well, it certainly looks like it's gonna be a hoot. Now, here in Australia, we're still waiting to find out where we get to see it, because um, we're at the uh, oh. the dirty end of the production deals. Yeah, so um, we, get, we get some of our drag and World of, World of Wonder on Stan, and we get some of our World of Wonder stuff on Paramount Plus. Um, okay. So we're just waiting, it's, it hasn't dropped on either of them yet. It'll be it'll be on one of them. I my money is on Paramount Plus because that's where it it was going to be on Paramount Plus originally, but that's just yeah. a rumor. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> we'll see. Um, we'll be patient or creative, one of the two, and we'll. Uh, Hopefully, you get to see it before Christmas. <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> That would be fantastic. Well, that's the bitch who stole Christmas. So keep an eye out for it wherever we can see our drag on yeah. TV down here. Now, Miss Peppermint, what's next? Where are we going to see your shining face and hear your beautiful voice and more of your amazing stories? Well, if people would like to hear my voice, they can go and stream my album, A Girl Like Me, Letters to My Lovers. It's a throwback 90s R&B album yes. all about a relationship that I was in uh, where I got dumped. Uh, but I really wanted the opportunity to talk about just, you know, without in a, not in a coded way or not in a way that's kind of secretive, just very straightforward way talking about being a queer black woman in, in a relationship and, ha and have that be the truth. Uh, because, you know, there's a lot of queer artists and I think we take that for granted these days because there, it's not like we have an overwhelming amount of out queer artists in the, in the music industry, first of all, but even of those who are, you know, they're relatively new, but we know that queer people have been around for a long time. They just haven't had the app been a felt good about coming out while they were working and having their careers. And so I wanted the opportunity to have a song or an album, what just work art that was out that people could listen to and connect to in a way that I knew that I would have wanted and that I needed when I was coming up and, and figuring out things. Um, and so that's out now. It's everywhere people stream. It's called A Girl Like Me, Letters to My Lovers, and the movie is on out TV. And then uh, on Amazon Prime, I was so happy to play, a, have a cameo, a little bit more than a cameo, in a, um, a new TV series called Harlem, which happens to be where I live in New York City. And it's about, it's basically, people will probably call it the Black Sex in the City, but it's so much more. Um, and so it's called Harlem and it's out on Amazon Prime now. Beautiful. Well, we'll look out for Harlem. We'll look out for Miss Peppermint, uh, Letters to My Lover, uh, and all our good uh -huh. music streaming services as well. Make sure you catch the grand finale of Call Me Mother and look out for a season two of it as well. Miss Peppermint, thank you so much for chatting to us today. It has been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> 
Thank you, baby. Thank you so much. <laughs> We look forward to seeing more from you and for everybody else out there, please make sure to go and follow Miss Peppermint online on all of her good socials and be sure to press the buttons down below here and subscribe to our Q News YouTube channel for more in the future. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm Mike, Michael James and this has been Miss Peppermint. Thank you so much, dear. Have a great day. Bye.